is full of contradictions. Some are easy to recognize. Night and day, high and low, far and near, hot and cold. Some are more difficult to notice, strong and weak, full and hungry, gentle and violent. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today we'll discover that Scripture is full of seeming contradictions. For example, Jew and Gentile, or slave and free. But as our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us, one contradiction lies at the heart of God's Word. So grab your Bible and get ready to dig deep into God's Word as we uncover the truth about law and grace. We've got just a few minutes before our sermon begins, so while you find your seat on the Bible bus and get settled, I'd like to share a letter from a fellow listener named Mariana in Russia. Now, it's a bit longer than what I normally read, but I know that you're going to love it as much as I do. Here it is. My husband and I were Orthodox, like everyone else in our community. Once in a while, we would stop by a church and buy a candle, and when we learned that our daughter had become an evangelical, to say that we were worried is an understatement. We heard so many stories about children from good families getting into cults and losing not only material things, but also themselves. People were telling us horrifying stories, and our daughter was trying to convince us that her church was full of joy and she was learning about God. Well, since we have always trusted each other in our family, my husband and I decided not to create a power struggle, but continue to communicate with our daughter and try to monitor what she read and listened to. One of the things that she spent a lot of time doing was listening to Through the Bible. One day in my worry, I decided to listen to it with my husband. Soon we realized what a valuable resource it was. We never heard anything like it. We are so grateful the Bible was actually explained, and we began to understand the things of God. Long story short, we met our daughter's friends, joined a small group, and eventually became members of the evangelical church. Many of our friends are now afraid for us, but we tell them that God loves them and that he too wants them to use their minds and understand his word. This is the opposite of what cults do. Thank you so much for all your help and guidance. Isn't that a great letter? Well, if you haven't guessed it, our world prayer team is traveling on their knees this week to Russia and the Commonwealth of Independent States, and we sure hope that you'll join us in praying for God's Word to reach more people in these countries by signing up at ttb.org forward slash pray. Do it today. And if you'd like to share what God is doing in your life through our time in His Word, we'd love to hear you leave a message on our listener testimony line. Just call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or you can always email us at BibleBus at ttb.org. We really would love to hear your story, so please get in touch with us today. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide as we study your word. Open our hearts today that we can hear directly from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Law and grace represent two opposing systems. They are diametrically opposed to each other. They are as far as the east is from the west. And there's no two galactic systems in God's vast universe that are any farther apart than law and grace. Both of these systems were ordained of God. They were given to man as a way of life over a definite period of time. But in spite of that, we must insist again that they are diametrically opposed to each other. Actually, law and grace are antonyms, just like light and darkness, night and day, high and low, hot and cold, wet and dry, far and near, black and white, and strong and weak, and law and great. The law put down certain requirements and stipulations. It put them down in black and white and spelled them out. 
The law put down certain standards, and it exacted a stiff penalty for the breaking over of the law, for the very slightest infraction of it or impingement upon it. The death penalty was obviously invoked on those who broke any one of the Ten Commandments. The Lord used capital punishment. It was practiced in the theocracy of Israel. And a great many people have been quick to find fault with the Lord for the way in which he did this. But may I say to you, whether you like it or not, if you're going to be under law, you either keep it or you don't keep it. You either follow it or you don't follow it. If you are not going to obey it to its detail, then you should dispense with it altogether. And so God put down a penalty, for there must be a penalty for every law that is given. There is the law of gravitation, and you go to the top of this building and step off, you'll find there is a penalty for not obeying that law of gravitation and not paying attention to it. And you'll find that when God had his people under law, that there was this penalty. I want to give you two examples that have been given to us specifically in Scripture to illustrate just what law really is. I turn back to the book of Numbers, the 15th chapter, and this is the law concerning the Sabbath day. And believe me, if you're going to want to get under the Sabbath day again, this is what it means. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the count. That's law, my beloved. And for breaking the Sabbath day under the Mosaic system, why this penalty was exacted. I do not know whether these today who are attempting to put believers under law really understand that and whether they really themselves would be willing to enforce the law to that extent. I've never asked any of my Seventh-day Adventist friends if they would be willing to stone a man to death that was found picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. But that, my friend, was the law. And then if you turn to the 21st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, you will find another instance concerning another law, and that was honor your father and your mother. And what happened to a man who didn't do that? Here's what happened. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they've chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear." Now, my beloved, that's the law, and that was the penalty for breaking any one of the Ten Commandments. I take it these are merely two illustrations to show what would happen when any one of the Ten Commandments were broken. Do you want back under the Ten Commandments today, even as a way of life? Do you want to live by the law today? I'm confident those who say they do do not really mean it because they're not willing to go all the way with God in this connection. Now, under the dispensation of law, it's seriously questioned 
whether anyone was saved by keeping the law. For 1,000 years, while the law was being enforced in Israel, there is no case on record of any man who was ever saved by keeping the law. For in the law, there was a part of it called the sacrificial system. It had to do with man's approach to God. It was a counterpart of the commandment. It was a place that God gave to them, a place that he gave specific instructions concerning. And on an altar, they were to bring a sacrifice and that sacrifice was a bloody sacrifice. And they were told, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That's God. Specific instructions to these people, if you please. And all of these sacrifices pointed to Christ, with no exception whatsoever. And when you get to the New Testament and read the message that was written to the Hebrews, to Israel, you will find that they were told the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, which simply means that under the Mosaic system, every sacrifice pointed to Christ. And since it pointed to Christ, it simply means that God had no other way of saving man except by the death of Christ. Will you listen to the writer of the Hebrews more specifically in the ninth chapter at verse 11? But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, that is, of a human construction, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then dropping down to verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. So that under the law, there was given a sacrificial system, and that sacrificial system had no meaning apart from Christ. Everything in it pointed to him. Everything in it moved to him. Everything in it found satisfaction and fulfillment in his coming and death. So that under law, God saved by the death and resurrection of Christ, for to God, he was the lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth. And beginning at the very beginning, God was saving men on credit and saying, my son is coming. He'll take up the paper. He'll pay in full for your remission. So that back under law, no man was ever saved by keeping the law. Now, my beloved, <clears throat> there therefore is a great difference between law and grace. But the great difference between law and grace is not the basis and foundation of salvation. I think it's radical enough to say that Abraham and Moses had to bring a little lamb. And by the same token to say today, you and I are strictly forbidden to bring a little lamb. Certainly anyone can see that we do not have the same system, that grace today looks back in faith and they look forward in anticipation and went through a ritual that pointed to the coming of Christ. But actually, the great difference was not there. It wasn't in the way of life 
but in the way of living that you have the real difference between law and grace. It was in the daily routine of their living. It was in their practical walk. It was in the everyday, humdrum, monotonous living that you see the distinction between law and grace. This is the Grand Canyon that distinguishes between these two great systems, if you please. Now, when you come to the Reformation, and the Reformation did wonders, it restored justification by faith that men were no longer saved by doing something, but men were saved by faith, justified by faith. But the Reformation, although it restored the great truth of justification by faith, it did not restore sanctification by faith. It did not restore sanctification by faith through the Holy Spirit. Now, I have here what I believe to be the finest confession of faith that has ever been written. It's the Westminster Confession of Faith. Today, I do not think, unless it's the Augsburg Confession, that you will find any that's better. Certainly in the English, this is the best. So I had to memorize the Shorter Catechism. And there was a time when I could give to you not only the answers to the questions, but I could give the question give the answer. Happy I'm not on trial this morning. I couldn't do it. May I say that this is a glorious statement. You just don't find things better. Listen to this. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Now, you can't beat that. At least I don't think I could beat that at all. But now I come to sanctification. It's good, too. Listen to this. Sanctification is the work. If you'll notice, oh, they were exact in those days. We're not today. How careless Christians are today, and especially the ministry. Minister is very very careless today in making statements. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. That's good. Justification is an act, one-time act. When you trust Christ, that very moment you're regenerated, made a son of God. That's never repeated. It's an act. But sanctification is a work. That means it continues. From the moment you're saved until you leave this world, the work of sanctification goes on in the life of a real born-again believer. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are unable more and more to die under sin, live under righteousness. Now, you can only improve that by adding the Holy Spirit. I think that should be put there, but... That's all right, because they bring the Holy Spirit in. But now they begin to talk about what is that which God requires. God requires you keep the Ten Commandments, and that's all. And then they list them. Which is the first commandment? And then you answer it. It answers that. What does the first commandment teach? And goes through all ten of them. Now that is sanctification in reform theology today. And may I say to you that that is not what the Word of God teaches concerning sanctification. And it's the reason today that it, we have so much confusion in this particular field. We see in a system like this that man has been saved from the law. He was in the Egypt of the bondage of the law, and he's been saved and brought out of Egypt. But this never brings you into the promised land of having the Holy Spirit produce the fruits of the Spirit in your life and not. Well, what they do is they take you out in the wilderness and then take you on a round trip back to the land of Egypt and put you under law again as a way of life. That's exactly what it does. Having been delivered from the bondage of the law, 
we're not delivered into the liberty of the grace of God. And therefore, the Ten Commandments have become the standard for Christian living for a great many today. That's not the standard. If somebody says, does it mean you can break them? It doesn't mean you break them. It means you go higher than the Ten Commandments. God has called you to a higher plane. It's like flying in a plane. When you say, I now go by jet 30,000 feet, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have to pass the five and 6,000 foot level. You, you get to the 30,000, my brother, you've got to pass somewhere along the line the five and 6,000 foot level where the old planes flew. God now has called us to a higher plane. And it doesn't mean you break the law, but it does mean it is not the standard of, of living today. We've been called under the liberty of grace. And that is what Paul meant in the fifth chapter of Galatians, the fourth verse where he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, he's not talking about losing your salvation. The fact of the matter is, he's not talking about salvation in the fifth chapter of Galatians. He discussed that in the first few chapters. When you get to the fifth chapter, he's telling you how you're to live as a Christian. And it's now sanctification by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that since you've been saved by grace, God no longer saves you on the basis of the law, but by his marvelous infinite grace. Don't fall from grace down to the low level of the law to live. Stay up there and live on the high plane. That's what he's talking about. Now, again, I use that. You cannot live by both of these systems. You can't be saved by one and live by the other. When you go to Chicago today, there are two popular means of travel, train and plane. And when you decide you're going by train, you just can't step out of the, of the train up into a plane. You just can't do it. And my brother, when you start off on a plane, you better not try to step down on the train. You better stay up there as long as it stays up there. May I say to you that... Uh, there are two means of traveling. There are two ways of living today, by law or by grace. And if you're living by grace, you're living on a higher plane than the law ever provided. Now, grace provides this higher standing for living than the law did. And it's as high as the heaven is above the earth. Law was an earthly standard given to curb the old nature. Grace is a heavenly standard given that the new nature might express itself in our hearts and in our living, in our attitude, and in all of our relationship. Now, I want briefly this morning for you to look at the standard which grace provides for us today. And I want to use a figure of speech which the New Testament uses, and that is that the Christian life is a walk. It's a walk. There are some of our, these that are on the lunatic fringe today, especially in Southern California, think the Christian life is a balloon ascension. You come down front or you go somewhere and you get all pepped up and helped up over something and up you go. You think you're a rocket taking off. May I say, you don't go into orbit living the Christian life. You walk down the streets of Los Angeles. It's walking down the street of our cities, our community, our neighborhood. That's where we live the Christian life. And you will find that Paul says in Romans 6, and I want you to notice these verses now, and I don't want to weary you with them, but they're important today. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now let's not get all tied up about a mode of baptism. Let's forget that. Let's talk about the thing Paul's talking about, that we might walk in newness of life. 
That's where God's called today. Having saved us, and here in Romans, in the sixth chapter, Paul has moved over into the area of Christian living. And he says, now, this is the way that it's going to be done. You, when Christ died, you died. When he was raised, you were raised. He's at God's right hand. You're in Christ. Now, you are to walk down here in newness of life. Now, that is the kind of life the child of God down here is to, is to live. We're living in an age that has produced probably more comfort, more gadget. The, this scientific age, and especially in the field of electronics and mechanics, has just moved out, and it's been a wonder. But isn't it strange that as science has moved out today, man has gone down morally? And our literature today reveals it. Now, I personally do not care for Tennessee Williams. I think that his literature, his plays, are as filthy and as dirty as anything possibly can be, but they depict life as it is today. He never has had a hero or a heroine that were anything short of a harlot or a pervert. And in England today, the literature is the same way. And here's what one of the writers, the most popular of the angry young men of Europe, has written. I suppose people of our generation aren't able to die for good causes any longer. There aren't any good, brave causes left. If the Big Bang does come, we all get killed off. It won't be in aid of the old-fashioned grand design. It'll just be for the brave new nothing very much, thank you. About as pointless and inglorious as stepping in front of a bus. That is modern literature. And that depicts man as he's living today. My friend, when God saves you and regenerates you, he's called you to a newness of life. To live on a new plane altogether, new attitudes, new relationships, new everything, if you please. Now, that is not all. Will you listen to Paul again in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, first verse? And this is the first thing Paul wrote, that is, for as Scripture is concerned. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, and how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Paul says that. Today, our walk is a walk that should please God. Now, honestly, this morning, we've made a few, a few nice little commandments. In fact, we've even added to the Ten Commandments. And we don't do this, and we don't do other things. But ask yourself sincerely the question this morning. Be very frank with yourself today. Are you walking that is pleasing to God today? Well, that's where he's called. He's called you to a walk that is pleasing to him. Paul says, that is the plane. That's a high plane, is it not? It's an exalted and lofty plane. Now, you may be called a square, but you'll please him. That's for sure. Now, will you listen again? That's not all. Paul goes on in First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. The walk means that you walk honestly before those on the outside. That doesn't end it. First Thessalonians, the second chapter, 12th verse, that ye walk, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. What a challenge that is. You are to walk worthy of God today in the world. That's a very high standard, is it not? Now, will you notice that does not conclude all that he has to say. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, first verse, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, 
beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now Paul, in the first three chapters, has talked about our position in Christ up yonder in the heavenlies. And that's very theoretical. But Paul will never leave it theoretical. We may be up yonder in Christ, but believe me, every Christian is a long fellow. <laughs> the man who flew high in an airplane, his feet dragged the ground, long fellow. May I say to you that every Christian is a long fellow. His head is in heaven, but his feet are down here on this earth, and he's to walk down here. You're to walk worthy of the high calling wherewith you're called. He doesn't stop there. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. He's not through. In the fifth chapter again, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now we are also told in Colossians 4, 5, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. We are to walk honestly before the world. And we are to walk in wisdom before the world. I do not believe that we should be fanatic before the world today. And I do not think that it uh, commends the gospel of Christ to go into a group of unsaved people and almost insult them by questioning their conduct. We've got so many that feel like they're doing the Lord's work if they walk into a group and tell them, well, you ought not to be doing this. Well, maybe you ought not to be doing it, but they've got a right to do it. They're the devil's children, and the devil lets them do it. Therefore, you and I today ought to walk in wisdom toward those that are without and then he mentions here that we're to walk in love. And that love is much higher than the law. Moses said, you're to love your neighbors, you love yourself. And today you can find many examples of men that have laid down their lives for their friends and for their relatives. Every year, medals are given out to different individuals who during the year have sacrificed their lives or were willing to in order to rescue or to save some other individual. There have been marvelous examples of human love on that plane. Our Lord put it on a new plane today. He said, a new commandment I give you. New? Yes. Why is it new? Because he said that you love one another. But the standard is what's new, even as I have loved you, as Christ loves us. And Paul carries that same thought, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. The same kind of love, if you please. Now, someone says, but isn't that a pretty high plane? Sure is. The early church almost can... Uh, evangelized the world. In fact, they evangelized the Roman world. They did it in 200 years. And by 300 A.D., the world, even in many places like England, which was pretty pagan at that time, that's where I think most of our ancestors were. They sure were filthy savages up there. And uh, the, they were evangelized. And they were evangelized by a church that was not so much concerned about service, but manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. And it was Tertullian. I quote him frequently, as you know. He lived about 200 A.D. Tertullian says that unbelievers were often heard to remark how these Christians love 
one another. And that's the reason the pagan world was drawn to Christianity. Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and who himself was an agnostic, and a blatant agnostic, if you please, he gives as one of the reasons for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire, he says, was because of the unity of the early Christians. He says, they constituted a unified brotherhood in which they loved each other. May I say to you, the church will never evangelize again, nor will it go to the ends of the earth until there is that love on the inside. And when that love began to disappear, everything else disappeared. And there'll never be revival, cannot be revival, because God would not mock himself by sending a revival where people do not love one another. Now somebody's going to say, and I'm going to close now, this, this standard's too high for me today. Under law, it might have been possible for me to love somebody. My neighbors, I love myself. I have a wonderful neighbor, and I do love him. I love her. But when you say to, I'm to love my be fellow believers as Christ loved me, I can't attain to it. May I say to you that God knew that you couldn't attain to it. In fact, the matter is, he told us we could not attain to it. In fact, we never could attain to the law standard to tell the truth. And the law provided no help. It gave no aid or assistance to man at all. But God today has provided a way. And it's not in man. It's not anywhere in our psychological makeup. We have no capacity. We have no ability. We have no attitude to love like that, nor do we have any kind of a desire to even come to that plane. Will you listen now to Paul, and I'll conclude. In Galatians 5:16, Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me change it a little. This I say then, walk by means of the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Back to the business of walking. It's walking now by new power, that which is not within us at all. We have no capacity, we have no ability. But now the Holy Spirit has come. He indwells a believer. We're now told to walk in the Spirit. In Galatians 5 again, verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Yeah, I think this is very practical. It means that when you and I get up, that you and I are to say, I have no ability today, I have no power, but I want today to live like a Christian. I want to act like a Christian. I don't want to put up any subterfuge or, or a false facade. I, I don't want to be the full of brush man and shaking hands. I want to stand for that which is right, and yet I want to be loving. May I say that if you and I face that each day, and I think practically each moment of the day, and then turn these lives of ours over to God, Rec recognizing our helplessness. For you and I have an old nature, and that old nature deceives us today. You know that old nature, he'll permit you to do most anything if you just let him live. he let you sacrifice anything. he let you suffer anything. he let you be religious. he let you teach a Sunday school class. he let you sing in the choir. he let you preach. he let you do anything in the world just so you let him live. 
just so you let him have his way. When you and I are willing to abdicate and say, Lord Jesus, I want the Holy Spirit to take over today. I think it'll make a difference in our living. That Sunday can be carried over into Monday, and we can present something that will be worthwhile before the world. God has provided help today. I close with this. I want to read the eighth chapter of Romans, the first four verses, and I'm going to read from my own translation. This is the best one that's ever been turned out, by the way. Will you listen to it? Therefore now, not one condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus liberated me from the law of the sin and of death, that old mosaic system, for the thing impossible for the law in which it was powerless through the flesh, God having sent his own Son in the likeness of the flesh of sin, and in regard to sin, condemn the sin in the flesh in order that the justification of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to flesh, but according to the Spirit. How are you walking today? Are you walking by the flesh? Are you walking by the Spirit? Makes all the difference in the world. Longfellow could take a worthless sheet of paper, write a poem on it, and make it worth $6,000. When Longfellow did that, it was genius. Rockefeller could sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth a million. When Rockefeller did it, it was capital. But the United States government can take a piece of paper and stamp on it a figure, they can put on it a thousand, and they can make it worth a thousand dollars. That's money. A mechanic today can take material that's worth three dollars and fifteen cents and make it worth a hundred and fifty dollars. That's skill. An artist can take a 50-cent piece of canvas and put five cents worth of paint on it, and he can make it worth $1,000. That's art. But God can take your soul and my soul, worthless, sinful, unworthy, it, and he can wash it with the blood of Christ, put his spirit within us, and enable us to walk through this world as sons of God. And God can do that. Right where you are sitting, you can receive Christ as your Savior and trust him. If you'd like to know more about how you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and trust Him today, please visit our website at ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find several resources to listen to and read that we've gathered just for you. Or if you'd prefer, we can send you a few of these resources in the mail. Please call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Thank you again for joining us today on the Sunday Sermon. I hope that you'll join us next week for Dr. McGee's message titled Capital Punishment and the Present Crisis. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're praying that God's great grace, mercy, and peace would be with you until we meet again. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.